I have a history of alcohol use disorder in my family, as I think um, a lot of people do. And early on, uh, 14, 15 years old, I started experimenting. Again, I think as a lot of people do in Western culture, it's kind of that, um, you know, coming of age, sneaking out, getting to, to try things you're not supposed to be doing. And for me, I knew very quickly that it was um, <laughs> something I should definitely not be doing because I enjoyed it far too much. Um, and I think as I've learned from researching the book and then as my research has continued, um, as everything has evolved, as um, the sober curious movement continues, as people start to drink less, just in general, um, drinking, you know, is kind of on its way out the door. Um, I have found that for people like myself, but maybe you as well, who have that predisposition, um, that genetic differentiator, um, alcohol does something different for us, right? It doesn't make us that tired, kind of, you know, relaxed, like it's exciting. And so that's how it made me feel. And I know I was very anxious and socially awkward um, and really uncomfortable with myself. Um, and I didn't feel like that when I drank, I felt like a totally different version of myself. Um, like I had that cloak on where um, nothing could really hurt me. I couldn't be anxious. I couldn't be upset. Um, although obviously later on in the evenings, um, emotions would skyrocket, but that led me into trouble, a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, and then eventually um, finding treatment um, I was 22 when I went to rehab and that kind of first experience was a, a little bit eye-opening. I want to say, I still didn't think I had a problem. I didn't think that I was old enough. And I think that's something that a lot of people kind of have this idea, like you have to be of a certain age to potentially have a problem, but anything that is an addictive substance can affect any age um, as it's physically dependent. And so I eventually did not stay sober. Then I got sober. Um, and at the time there wasn't really anything available outside of traditional programming. So and the treatment center that I went to um, took us to um, Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. And so I didn't, I knew from the beginning that wasn't really my home base. And what I mean by that for me personally was that um, I loved the community aspect. I think that's so important. I loved the support and I loved that I could be around other people who understood a lot of things about me and the way that I think and my past history that people in my everyday life, my parents, um, my friends, some of them at the time, all of them, um, I didn't have any buddy sober in my life. Um, they didn't get it. Um, why I would continue to do things with consequences and repeat them? obviously the definition of insanity, right? Um, and so that's what I really liked about the program, but um, I did not and, and still don't identify with an organized religion. And so it was hard for me to get past the God aspect. Also, it's kind of like a recovering Catholic, I like to joke. Um, I didn't like the shame or the punishment, um, the reward system, the hierarchy, um, but I went because I knew that I needed something. I needed a tool in order to stay um, away <laughs> from alcohol um, and for me others and other substance as well. Um, but eventually it just kind of stopped working. Um, and what I think I mean by that 
is I had gotten everything that I, I could out of the traditional program. And, but I didn't know what to do with it next. Um, I didn't want to leave because I was told, okay, well, if, if you leave, you're definitely going to go drink and you're going to go back to where you started probably worse. And I said, okay, well, I don't want that. Um, um, and what I had experienced while I was there, which was for about two years, um, when people left, even if they didn't go out to go drink or anything, um, they were kind of shunned. And so I didn't want to be shunned and I didn't want to relapse quite. So I, so I just kind of stayed, um, which didn't work obviously. <laughs> um, and I was very, very lucky. I had a very come to moment um, with a friend arguing about the quote unquote disease of alcoholism. Um, this person's father was an alcoholic. And, you know, at the time that's how I identified. And he told me, you know, go look. Um, there's no signs behind this, whatever. Go look, go find how this is a disease, come back and I'll believe you. And so I went on this like little research hunt. I couldn't find anything um, because that was kind of always my fallback at the time. It was like, you know, I was sick, I was sick, I was sick. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of accountability. It was more of just that wasn't me at the time. Um, and although it wasn't, and although I do understand, obviously, when we're under the influence, we do things that we normally wouldn't do. Um, it's not a disease in the same way that cancer is a disease, right? So I was introduced to a book called The Biology of Desire by Mark Lewis, which literally the subtitle is Why Addiction is Not a Disease. And it completely changed my thought process. And I'm thankful that I was open-minded enough to be able to read this book and to not be closed off to the idea that maybe what I was doing wasn't going to be working and that I needed to look at things in a different light. And this book did that for me. And so I left AA. And that is why I originally created the dry club. Um, you know, I was, I guess at the time, 25 or 26, I wanted to connect with other people, um, especially other young people that weren't drinking and maybe even just, you know, I wanted to continue to do all of the regular things that 25 year olds do. I like to go out, was living in Los Angeles. You know, this is the hub of socialization and, and parties and uh, nightlife. And just, there's always something to do. And I didn't want to just sit in my house and do nothing. Um, but I wanted to have like, a, how do I balance that? Right. Like, because I'd been taught and I think society teaches this too, um, you know, you're not allowed to be somebody who doesn't drink or somebody who drinks very little and still likes to go and, and go to concerts or go out to the bar with your friends or stay out late. Um, and I think that it also depends on your age and your personal um, preferences, but um Everything that I thought was going to happen happened. I got shunned. A lot of my friends stopped talking to me. Thankfully, um, my good friends, my two best friends did not. And very quickly, the dry club grew. It literally started off as the thousand hours dry challenge, um, which was a celebratory challenge when I hit my 1000 days sober. But obviously, I was not going to challenge people to do that. That was like a little bit I want to say I was like close to three years or a little over three years. Um, so a thousand hours, which is a little bit closer to six weeks, um, seemed doable, you know, like a 30 day challenge for overachievers. So it started out, it literally everything that I have now done started with a hashtag that I created on Instagram. Um, and it quickly caught on so much so that I had to create its own page, which is now the thousand hours dry page. Although um, I haven't been connected with a thousand hours dry now for a couple of years, that was uh, acquired by reframe when um, we had built that. And then it was part of that. So 
I was just totally immersed into this online community that was growing so rapidly and it was so exciting. Um, and, and it just brought a lot of hope, I think to me and to a lot of the other people that I'm still connected with to this day that had the, that had been there from the beginning, whether they were helping me run the page by hosting it or people that I still know that got sober or found um, their own healthier relationship with alcohol through doing the challenge. And eventually that challenge um, and the growth of that community brought attention and that attention brought me to meeting my old co-founders, um, former co-founders of the Reframe app. And it was kind of very serendipitous as I had wanted to create an app at the time for what, what, what I was doing, which is basically just education in a digestible format, right? Like all the information is out there, but nobody wants to go read <laughs> like a, you know, a hundred page or 50 page peer reviewed essay online. And half the time you can't even access them unless you have, um, you know, uh, a therapist number and things like that. So, or your license number. So I just found a way really through my own needs and, and found this kind of, or created this watering hole. It's kind of the best way I think to describe it because I didn't want to replace anything else. I just wanted to create another thing. Um, and I think that's, again, a misconstrued um, opinion I've gotten in the past is like, well, if we're telling people to drink less, then we're not, we're not telling people not to drink. And that's not true. I think we all have to figure out what's best for us on our own. But the best place to start, no matter where you end, is to start to just, you know, look at what is my relationship with alcohol? How does it serve me? How does it not serve me? Um, and so, you know, <laughs> an amazingly uh, whirlwind at Reframe, creating content, creating challenges, um, running meetings, um, and then it, it came to an end and I just knew it was my time to move on to something else. And I had already been approached by Watkins here, um, to write a book. And in my mind, I had already had this thought, um, of the word soberish and the idea itself was not, it was kind of meant to be ironic, like Soberish is not a label, um, although now people tend to use the word as uh, having a specific meaning, but my definition of it was not really meant to be anything. It was just meant to say, like, for those of us that don't want to be put into a box. And so I was at, um, and I know I talk about this in the book too, but at the time that I was writing the book, it was actually in a really very not- I was just not in a good place in my life. Um, I just gotten separated and I had moved back to my hometown. And that is when I left Reframe and I had to really, really start over, which in a way was perfect. It was the perfect time to write the book, right? Um, because I didn't have anything else to do, one. Um, and because I was at this place um, where I was questioning my own identity and my own um, relationship with alcohol. Um, again, I talk about it a little in the book. Um, I had been abstinent for about four years and then I kind of took myself out of that label and said, you know what, um, I'll kind of allot myself if I feel like having a drink once in a while, I'll do it if I feel it's appropriate. Um, and so I did that. And um, so I was actually 
drinking at the time that I was writing this book. Um, and not very often, but again, I was kind of questioning my own, um, relationship as obviously there's pressure that comes with, you know, obviously before being an author, but being a co-founder of an app that was doing really well, or being the, the founder of, um, you know, a thousand hours dry. And, um, I wanted to make sure that whatever my relationship was with alcohol, um, it was my choice. It was not because I was doing it for other people or to please other people. Um, and it also really allowed me to go back to my foundation. And that's really where like the meat and the core of the book for me is, is the toolkit and the, you know, plan of action, because for a lot of people in abstinence or in sobriety, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, over time, you get comfortable, you stop doing all the things that you did. I think we all do it for a lot of things, right? With fitness, with nutrition and relationships, you get really comfortable and you do all of the things you need to do at the beginning. And then later on, you start to kind of slack because you're like, oh, I'm comfortable. I'm doing well. Everything's fine. And that is when something happens and you are not prepared. And that's usually when people kind of have those backsliding behaviors that I talk about, myself included. And so I'm... <laughs> This book is so important to me, not just because, um, you know, of, of being able to really put my truth into something and share it with people. Um, but also as I was writing it, I was living it also and really reevaluating my own relationship with alcohol as I was writing the book, um, which eventually for me led me back to abstinence is best for me, not because of the relationship I had in the past with alcohol, which was very tumultuous. And again, like I said, there were, um, and that there was another substance involved and it just was completely unmanageable. Whereas to now I am very much, um, you know, I'm a fitness trainer. I teach Legree, which is a form of Pilates, um, you know, I advise other companies in this space. Um, I'm always talking about, um, alcohol. And I think for those of you who are on here, I assume you've read the book. It's hard to unlearn once you know things, right? And so here I am really practicing, um, essentialism and more recently, like longevity and just trying to do things to prevent myself from later on suffering, which as we know, like there's just so many, so many things that we don't want to get later on in life. Um, and so in order to do that, the best thing to do is obviously to stay healthy now and do what we can to consume properly. Um, and we don't have a lot of control over a lot of things, right? Um, what's happening in the world. Um, you know, we can read the labels and things as we go to the grocery store. But again, as we know, everything is a little bit, uh, a little bit shady. And so I can control, right? What I can, what I put in my body in that sense. And it just doesn't serve me anymore. Um, the hangovers aren't worth it. I'm 31 now. I'm about to be 32 and I cannot just puke and rally <laughs> in the way that I could when I was 21. They, the hangover is a good two or three days, even, even two or three glasses of wine. Um, and then also just knowing the dangers of like the carcinogenics and things like that for me, also someone who suffers from an anxiety disorder, uh, the, the cons outweigh the pros. Is that to say I'll never have another drink again? No, I don't like to make those kind of like intense, uh, you know, 
promises or whatever. I, I think when we tell ourselves we're going to do something like that, it's also like a lot of pressure. I just focus on what does today look like? What does my week look like? How am I going to use the tools in my toolkit? Like the ones in the book, I use most of them myself. Either I have used, I've used all of them. Currently, you know, as we evolve, as we age, as our environment changes, um, as what we're going through changes, um, the tools that we use obviously change. You know, you can't use one tool for everything. And so like, I'll joke with people like fitness right now and has always been as a former athlete, like a major, major tool for me. Like I totally believe movement is medicine. Um, I do my best to practice any intuitive movement. It is difficult um, as someone who tends to overexercise and also as somebody who had struggled with, um, you know, past eating disorders and just being a woman in a society that uh, has a lot of high expectations for the way that we look um, when it's none of anyone else's business. Um, so I love to attend group classes. I love teaching, but, you know, let's say I'm having a panic attack in the middle of the, the highway, you know, where I'm stuck in traffic. I can't just, you know, get out of my car and go for a run or, you know, I can't break out into a yoga move. Uh, but I can do breath work. Um, you know, I can turn on, I, I have this one song in particular that I go to for the humming. Um, that I talk about in the sound therapy um, chapter of the book and really getting into more of the theta waves and the sound therapy. And I'll put on the blast the AC and I'll use those tools that are in that back pocket for me for that time, right? So that was the biggest thing I think for me with the book was that no matter what you were really looking for, even if you were like, I have no idea what this hot pink book is. Um, <laughs> but sober ish kind of sounds like what I'm going for. I, I just wanted people to be able to walk away after they had finished reading and go, you know what? Like I, I really learned something, not just about, um, alcohol or society's relationship with alcohol. Um, but really learned something about myself and, hopefully your relationship with alcohol has changed for the better. Um, no matter what kind of goal you had set for yourself, um, this is a continuous journey and it's not linear whatsoever. So setting some expectations for yourself, but always being kind, um, I think is super important. And you know, ever since the book came out, I think for me, again, right, with setting expectations, all I really wanted from the book was to know that it was helping people in a way that other things have helped me. And I've received so much like loving feedback, emails, direct messages, things like that from people just kind of telling me a little bit about themselves and their story and how the book helped them or it helped them understand a loved one. And it made writing a book is not freaking easy. <laughs> it was a very difficult, difficult thing to do, especially going through um, a separation and probably like, I guess a, a quarter life crisis. Um, but just being able to tangibly hold it in my hand and know that even if it had helped just one person, it was going to be worth it. And I really, I really think that now has been the perfect time. The universe is very much aligned. Um, a lot of the things that I've had the, the honor of being a part of, um, you know, things like the reframe app and things like the book and now companies that I, that I advise 
and that I, and that I help grow. And I just never ever would have expected um, the world to be the way it is now. And when I say that, <laughs> I'm like literally actually speechless because when I think about the, you know, the 24, 25 year old version of me sitting in a traditional meeting going, okay, what is my life going to look like for the, is this just going to be my life? Like, I just have to go to meetings all the time. And, um, like I didn't, for me, like I didn't quit drinking just to sit in a meeting every day and not ever get to do what I wanted to do. Like I quit drinking so I could go and live my life the way that I wanted to live my life because alcohol was holding me back from a lot of things and, and causing me to miss a lot of opportunities because I was putting it first. Um, and so to kind of blink and fast forward to 2014, where there are non-alcoholic bars, there are non-alcoholic bottle shops. Um, people don't want to drink and it's not because they have an alcohol use disorder or because their family does. It's because they just don't want to because they don't see a reason to. Like it, it kind of, it, it blows my mind that it's, it, it was not just a trend. It has become a movement. And now with things like Ireland in 2026, you know, putting labeling on alcohol the way that they're going to be or currently have in a lot of countries labeling uh, tobacco products, nicotine products um, with warning labels and just this idea that it's no longer going to be put on such a pedestal. Um, I didn't think I think I, I always knew that it would happen in my lifetime, but I was expecting this maybe like 20 years from now. So the fact that everybody, thankfully, <laughs> not maybe not everybody, but thankfully with, I think the help of things like the internet and social media and just the availability of information, um, people get to be their own researcher. They get to look and find for themselves um, community and support and hopefully truth. Obviously there's a lot of misinformation out there. Why I always go back to like, find a peer reviewed source, find, make sure your sources is good, not Wikipedia. Um, uh, but yeah, I, as I'm, you know, sitting here, I'm drinking you know, some juice from some organic fresh press, whatever. Like I did not ever think I'd be this person. Like it's Friday here morning. <laughs> and normally I would probably be like hungover um, or actually definitely asleep. I would be asleep for sure. Um, and now I'm somebody who wakes up at like 4.30 on a Saturday to teach Pilates not because I have to, but because I want to. Um, and I've become this totally other version of myself and I joke with a lot of people, um, but it feels very uh, true to me in the sense that I have had the, the really the blessing of being able to live two lives in one, especially at such a young age. Um, I think a lot of people um, have come to the same realizations that I have in a lot of ways, but later down the line. So I didn't have very much to lose. And so I'm lucky in that sense. Um, so although I may not connect with an organized religion, I do believe very much so that the universe allowed me to find this path in order to help people in order to continue to evolve myself and learn and whatever I learn, I put it right back out there and I want to share it. And, um, because I was in a lot of situations where I would pro most, I, I most definitely should not still be here. Um, but 
I'm really excited to talk with you guys um, about it and answer any questions you guys have or just hear your own stories and, you know, what kind of brought you to the book or brought you to the panel or if you have any um, questions out, outside of the book or pertaining to the book, like just excited to have this conversation with you guys. And um, yeah, thank you for coming. even what you brought up with the the chart, right? It's like, since I wrote the book, because even the book was published in September, I think I had actually finished writing it. And then obviously it had to be edited and all that stuff. Um, Canada now is two drinks per week for both sexes. Like that's how quickly things have changed. And I know that America um, is looking into similar um you know, again, these are, uh, you know, not, not to say like, this is a, you have to do this, right? Like it's, again, it's a guide, um, based on science, based on, on research. And so, um, I think it says a lot about, um, the way that, uh, alcohol is kind of propagated in different countries. Um, for example, I think in Europe, obviously the drinking ages is, is younger. It's even a lot younger in a lot of countries. And so, you know, things like DUIs or, um, you know, I, I don't want to get into like gruesome details of other things, but there's lower levels of alcohol related incidences or deaths because and I'm not, not saying it's a good thing to introduce alcohol at 14, but at the same time, when you're saying, Hey, you're sitting your, your kid down and going, Hey, this is what this is. This is what this does. This is why we drink X, Y, Z or whatever. And now that's, that's kind of not even relevant either, because, you know, like my parents had to read this book. And they learned so much from it because both of my parents are, you know, what kind of uh, people call like normies, right? So people, <laughs> I still love to use the word, use the word. I think it's fun. Um, a normie is just somebody who has never had an alcohol use disorder or a substance abuse disorder. Um, and that was kind of the word that they used in traditional programs to describe, which again, you know, was this separation of them and us, right? But it's just a perfect example of I had two parents who neither had a problem with alcohol. So there was no, nothing in, in my home. And yet me and my younger biological brother are both sober for reasons, um, not just for the health of it. Um, but I think, and really for me, um, one of the things that was super interesting to me as I've always been, I, I went originally to school for psychology. And then as you know, my uh, uh, attention span went away from academics, I switched over to um, other, uh, another major that did not, you know, did not require as much. And so I got away from that. But when I stopped drinking and I went back to school, um, I was looking really heavily into consumer psychology. Um, and for anybody unfamiliar with that specific um, niche, it's really consumer psychology or psychologists are the ones that work for companies. Um, they, they don't have to, but as an example, um, they use it in uh, one of my favorite books about habit, which is um, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. And he talks about consumer psychology and the consumer psychologist is the person who works for Target. And they say, this needs to be placed on this shelf at this eye line for this specific reason. These things need to be on. And this was a big one for me. And I go, oh my gosh. And like, it seems so obvious and it's not. At least here in America, when you go, there was a target that I used to go to, which is like, like, you can go and get 
really anything you need kind of a store. And then they also have a pharmacy that I would go to in it. And so while I was waiting in line in the pharmacy, I'm, of course, you know, you're looking at your phone, you're kind of looking around and I'm looking and they have all on the ends of all of the shelves, which is where the lines are, the sale racks. So I'm like, huh, well, let me just see what's in here. Of course, I don't need any of it, but Target's one of those stores you go in and you're like, I'm going to get it one thing and you never leave with one thing. And that was just one example of consumer psychology. You think, oh, this is just a sale rack. It's just put here because there's nowhere else to put it. No, it's specifically put there because they know people are going to be standing in that area, kind of not really having anything to do. And they're going to look and there's just something about sale that piques our interest, especially when it's like 30% or more. Um, and you end up buying more. It's that's, that's what you do. It's so in depth and so analytical. And so I was so interested in that and how they, how they, how you bring psychology and the behavior and human behavior together with analytics to basically make people buy things. And it's propaganda. Like literally I have this book called propaganda. It was written in the thirties. Oh gosh. Uh, the 1930s. I feel like when I say 30s now, it's like, it's almost like 2030. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but um, it was written really by um, the man who kind of created the word propaganda, which now has this negative connotation to it. But originally to propagate just meant to, to push an idea. It didn't have to be negative obviously it was used like world war one world war two in a negative way and so now when people think propaganda they think of this really negative connotation against it and so um to bring it back to where we were really what big alcohol and there's big everything right big food big tobacco, big pharma, um, tr trillion, multi-trillion, multi-billion dollar industries um, that are based on our consumption, period. Like they run because we purchase what they buy. And how do you get someone to purchase something you want? You propagate them. You Say, look at how interesting this is. Look at how great this is. Um, and so if you kind of, I wish I had been able to, but obviously for copyright reasons, we couldn't put, but I found some of these old ads. And if you're ever interested, you can look up these old ads for, out, for alcohol from like the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. And they're wild. They're like, in three beers later, she'll look a lot better. And I'm like, this was in a magazine, you know, like they, there's something about it. And I know I talk about it in the book. It just, they made it sexy. Right. And I think that's a huge pull, like sex does sell. And so this idea, and for a lot of us, it is, it's liquid courage. Um, they were able, and this happened, like I said, in the book, really right after the probation ended and they had this time to kind of swoop in and go, alcohol is not bad. Alcohol is great. It makes you social. You know, if you do it in the right way, you're sophisticated. If you drink certain types of drinks, you know, you can really become this other person. And I think people ate it up and they continued it to. And then you'd, people just don't question things anymore. Um, I think, unfortunately, we take things for face value a lot of the times. And that's where, you know, it takes some extra time. But like, I've become the person that goes grocery shopping and I'm looking at the nutrition label and I'm looking at the ingredients because I've learned, okay, well, natural flavors does not mean natural flavors. And I was like, huh, that's interesting, you know, and now with alcohol, the big one was it's not regulated by the FDA. It's regulated by a different government in, in, the, in, in Europe as well. But in all of these places, 
it doesn't have to have a nutrition label. And that was a big one. Um, not really necessarily for the calories, although I know for a lot of people that is a reason that they've gained weight or they're trying to lose weight. And when I tell clients, <laughs> you want to lose weight, that's the first thing you need to cut out. Um, but to me, I am 100%, I 100% believe people have the right to autonomy. Like if you want to go and drink, if you want to go and smoke dope, do live your life, but have all the information to do so, right? Like I'm a little bit extreme in that point. And that's where I think we have been really misled. Um, I know here in America, the statistics, I think one in only one in five Americans even knows that alcohol causes cancer, which is very alarming considering causes seven different types of cancers. And obviously as the continuum, you know, keeps happening, um, more and more information about how high the percentage and the correlation or the causation um, is. And so it's really just, I think it's frustrating and angering more than anything else because we were really brought up to believe that this was just something to enjoy. It was just a vice. Everybody knew like it wasn't great for you, you know, but it's like have a piece of cake every once in a while, have a piece of chocolate, right? But those things, obviously in moderation, <laughs> I'm not a big fan of, you know, uh, of non fruit sugars, but again, you know, they're not going to, you're, you're not going to eat a piece of cake and then go and get into a car accident because you're under the influence of cake. Unless I don't know, unless whatever's in your cake. Um, but just I'm in informed consent is really important to me. And that is what we don't have. And that is what I think a lot of countries and um, nonprofit organizations recently one reached out to me here in the United States are lobbying for to say, you know what, like we know big alcohol is not going anywhere. We're not asking for a prohibition that doesn't work, but we would like information and education to be widely known. Like, let's not pretend it is what it isn't. Let's label it properly. Let's let people make informed decisions for themselves. And that was a big one for me. And so I think Ireland taking that big step and Ireland, again, kind of stigmatically being known to be this very like heavy drinking country, them being the one to take the first big step is like a huge, huge call to everybody else to go, all right, well, we're doing it. Are you going to do it? Because it's just one step closer for people to understand, okay, what am I consuming? You know, do I want to take that risk? Because it is your choice. And so I've always felt like that was the most important thing to me is that people get to choose whatever they want to do. But a lot of us, myself included, would not have ever chosen being somebody who really, like I pride myself on, you know, researching and even at a young age, I've always been like kind of super type A, very, like, just very, um, I'm, well, I'm trying to think of the word, but I've always been kind of, you know, I question everything, which was really annoying, but I find it's a great personality trait to have now. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, it, it's, I don't, I, I think the only really difference between big like alcohol and big tobacco, which, you know, everyone's kind of saying is like, oh, big alcohol is having their big tobacco movement, mov movement moment is that big alcohol has the opportunity to still make money because they can do non-alcoholic options, 
which it's kind of like the devil you choose. You know what? I'd rather them have non-alcoholic options, especially the larger brands. Um, and I think that's also come up a lot too, is like people are like, well, do you support some of these larger, like massive, you know, multi-trillion dollar companies and, and their versions of it? And I'm like, yes. One, because it's ironic, because a lot of these people have been quoted saying, I would never, ever make a non-alcoholic version. And now they have lots, um, but they have the reach. So for the places that these smaller non-alcoholic companies are not going to be able to get into as fast, you know, they don't have the revenue um, example here, Heineken everywhere everywhere but especially for us here in like the south the the culture is different than the north or the west um that the drinking culture is heavier um there's still a lot more older traditional beliefs than the rest of the country and so kind of infiltrating there the sober curious movement and those kinds of things is a little bit harder so I'm totally supportive of these companies going and being able to get into their grocery stores and their restaurants and things like that and being available to people. And also because people recognize these big names. And so you're much more likely to go, oh, well, you know, a Budweiser or a Guinness. I know what that is. I'll try it out. I literally saw one when I was walking my dog. There was like a six pack of the recycling of a zero proof Heineken. And I was like, that's so cool. Only I would think trash is cool. Um, but that that's normal now. Um, but people who are not familiar in the space, who don't like live it, eat it, breathe it like I do, they're going to go for that over maybe like an athletic brewing company or some of these other brands that are amazing. And I'm just so excited with what they're doing. But at the same time, you know what? Let them pave the way. We can deal with that fully. I'll deal with them later once, you know, things have been normalized and um, people do have the options everywhere because it's still not totally available everywhere. We still have a lot of work to do, um, but we're getting there and it's happening a lot faster than I ever thought it would. And so I'm excited to be kind of a part of it on all fronts. That's why I currently do what I do, which is I advise different brands still within the niche. So I, I'm advising currently a different health tech company that helps people drink less, a non-alcoholic online um, bottle shop, soon to be in stores, and then um, a like marketing and PR agency that specifically only works with like non-alcoholic related brands. So to me, being able to give my knowledge to these growing brands, these startups, because I've been there and I go, this works, this doesn't work. This is what the people want. Let's move this way. Let's move quick because you're needed. Um, it's been super gratifying. Um, and I'm excited to continue to be able to be part of no, just normalizing drinking less like that's really what it is is like normalizing not having to get asked like oh you're not drinking or hey normally you're like bumping shots with us and you're you've had one one beer why like well it's not really any, anybody's business and nobody's asking anybody why they're not smoking cigarettes and so I kind of would like to see a world where it's just like that. It, it just has become a vice, which that's what it is. It's not self-care <laughs> um, as much as we'd like to think it is. Um, and again, just going back to like, it's not about shaming people. It's not about um, judgment. You know, we all have things that we, it's, it's, it's hard to control sometimes, or, you know, you, you have that really bad day and you just say, you know what, I'm, I need a glass of wine or, or whatever. And as long as that's not going to cause you to go and end up in a jail cell, 
and you have that relationship with alcohol, like that's, that's okay. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't have to be binary. It doesn't have to be so, so black and white. And I think that is what we've been dealing with for the last hundreds of years. And now it's finally recognized that there's a major gray area that's actually much larger than the black or white side on things. And so um, I'm, I'm happy to be part of that movement to just continue to spread the word um, and hopefully, you know, allow people to know that they're not alone in struggling, even if they're not wherever you are kind of on like the spectrum of maybe you're, you don't like how much you have been consuming and you want to cut back. Maybe you've known for a long time, and, but you don't know how, and you just need that guidance, but you you don't want to go into a traditional meeting um, and identify yourself as something um, that you're not, um, or that you, you just don't have to. Like, bottom line, no one is telling you you need to do anything. And so that's what I was, I was really hoping to get across with the book is just that there are infinite ways to change your relationship with alcohol because there are infinite ways to um, kind of create your own toolkit, right? It's, it's a buffet. What works for me might not work for you, vice versa. But there's so many things out there that we have to choose from. You just have to be willing to take the time um, and the effort to go and look and find those things and, and trial and error. Well, I think, um, you know, for me, I really kind of took it from other modalities of therapy um, as somebody who's been in therapy since I was like eight, maybe five. I don't even know. It's been my whole life. <laughs> so I've done every kind of therapy modality known to man. Um, and so I, I took really what I found I believed would be most helpful in this particular scenario. And a lot of it, again, kind of goes back to just like you said, awareness. There's just we have, you know, our, our, our subconscious and our unconscious and our subconscious is always on. And I think people sometimes forget that. And it's to really just digest it down into like almost like this, the most simple modality is I think of it as trigger, cue, reward. And we'll call rewar reward for now. It can mean a lot of other things. It could just mean, um, make this feeling stop. That could be the reward, right? And again, it's also doesn't have to be bad. I think a trigger can be good too. Like, right, you know, oh, I, I'm the rose colored glasses. And so it's really this idea of people, I think, tend to get stuck in this cycle of just really not understanding, like they in the, in the stages of change, you have denial and then eventually you have awareness, which is honestly the hardest thing I think for so many people is just to have this acceptance that like, okay, something is not right or is, or is off. I do not like the way that I'm drinking. Um, whether you want to call it problematic, how, however you, again, however you feel comfortable labeling it. Um, so we'll just kind of umbrella it for this and just say, okay, um, I don't like the way that I'm drinking right now. Like it's, it's, it's a little bit unmanageable. It's causing some issues. Maybe it's causing some issues in my relationship. Um, it's like you said, I, again, as we get older, you cannot deny the physiological differences between how people how all of us were able to drink when we were in our teens in our 20s versus your 30s your 40s your 50s just we cannot rally the same way um 
unless you are truly physically dependent on alcohol. And that is like a whole, obviously other level that in which I say, this is not the book for you. Let's, let's talk about detox. Let's talk about therapy and another, you know, uh, a much more serious tone. But for those of us who have gained a level of awareness, which obviously if you're on this webinar, if you've read the book, you have that. And then you have your stages of change. But I think for many of us, we're aware that there's an issue, but we don't know how to make it stop. Um, And we're just stuck in patterns. And it is so hard to get out of. And I think it's so easy to gloss over and go, well, why don't you just take alcohol out of the house? Or why, why not just don't stop at the liquor store on your way home, um, you know, or have, have one glass instead of having four glasses, like for people who don't have an issue with self-moderation, um, it doesn't make sense to them. Now, I also like to say, you know what, everybody has their own issues. So maybe they don't have a problem with alcohol, but they probably have a problem with something else because no one is perfect. (laughs) So really what the plan of action is meant to do is a yes, help you go. You know what you have, you have awareness now. That's awesome. You know, there's a problem. Let's dissect it a little bit more and how we do that whether you're taking notes in your phone, whether you're able to just keep that kind of in your brain. I'm, I'm someone who's very, again, like I want to put it pad to paper. I want to put it in my notes. So I remember I have got a lot going on. I have ADHD. I'm like looking over here. Oh, that looks nice. And then what, what was I doing? And, you know, so I need that structure. And I think honestly, for anybody, whether you have the most organized mind in the world like you need to create structure from the beginning. I mean, this is the foundation of a new lifestyle that you're trying to build the rest of your entire life upon. You know, think of it as building a house. Like you don't want to slack on the foundation here and go, oh, well, you know, get the cheap cement or, you know, buy the cheap wood. Like, no, you should probably go for the more expensive stuff. It's going to cost you a little bit more time and effort but guess what? This is your literal life. So you are worth it. And it it's, it's more than reasonable. And so starting to recognize, like I talk about in the book, okay, what do you feel before you drink normally? Or what are you doing? What time is it? Um, and after a couple of weeks of really, if you can think about it as like homework, or a task, especially if you're like a goal-oriented person, I find it like super helpful to think of it like that. Like it is your like little goal and you get to check it off at the end to, for the next two weeks, observe yourself. Think of it as doing like self-research. And if you find yourself drinking, which most of us, when we do, we're, it's it's so subconscious. We don't even think about it. You're just sitting there and you're drinking and then you go, huh. What made me pour that glass or what made me go to the bar? And we don't think about that stuff. But when you pause and you go, okay, well, I actually, I I always do it at this time. It's part of my routine. You know, whenever I'm making dinner, I always have a glass of wine in my hand. I just do it. There doesn't always have to be this like negative trigger or this positive trigger. Um, Sometimes it's just a cue. Like, when you create a morning routine, you know, you flick on your light and maybe most of us go directly to our phones. You know, we're not supposed to do that, but we do. Um, your brain, the way that it works, habit stacks things. If you ever notice sometimes, and this is this is a funny example, but it's true. Like the when I vacuum, I'll do it a certain way. And sometimes I'll forget to plug it in and I'll just pretend it's like I'm not even thinking about it, right? Like, I'm just like, this is how, if I'm thinking about something else, I'm just so used to getting it out, unraveling, click and go. But if, even if I forget one little bit, the rest of my brain is still going. And so I'm like, wait, why isn't this working? And I'm like, oh crap. Okay. So our brain just does. 
sometimes when it knows if you're doing the same thing every day or almost every day, your brain already knows what's going to happen. So it's preparing you for that. That's muscle memory, right? That's just general memory and, and how you get ready for things, how you mentally prepare for things and physically and emotionally. And so starting to pre kind of, um, like I said, when, what I wrote in the book, and again, you can do it in any way, but what I, what I would personally recommend is going on your phone in maybe the notes section, or obviously there's, there's so many cool apps nowadays, notion, things like that, where you write down, like, okay, every time I, that I drink, I'm going to write down like what time it is. And this is something you can do afterwards, right? Like, I think again, when we're in the moment, we're not like, oh crap, I need to do my little soberish, um, you know, activity, but it's something you can reflect on later in the evening, or maybe even the next morning when you go, okay, so I'm looking back and it's been a week and I have a couple of glasses of wine every night around six or seven o'clock. It's after I make dinner. It's after I have already, you know, I, maybe I, I finished making food or I finished helped cleaning up and got the kids washed and whatever, you know, the day is done. I'm tired. I just had a long work day or I just spent the whole day, you know, being the stay-at-home mom or being the stay-at-home dad, if you have kids, um, whatever you're doing, you're at the end of the day and you're done. <laughs> you're like, I just want to relax. I want to check out. And for a lot of us, that means going for a drink because obviously physiologically it does. It helps you relax. It helps you slow down. But again, the idea is for me and a kind of a little go-to quote is, you know, what dulls today's edge sharpens tomorrow's, which also puts into the cycle. You're a little bit more irritated in the morning and the next day, which only adds to why you're doing it at the end of the day. And so you go, okay, well now I'm noticing patterns in my behavior. What if I try something else in place of, like, I know that I'm tired, I know that I'm, I'm looking for something to help make me de-stress. What else is there out there? And that's where you go to the book for the toolkit. Or again, there's so many other things out there. Um, maybe you already have hobbies that you like to do that you can go, you know what, instead of pouring that glass, I'm going to go work on my art or I'm going to go and read this book, or I'm going to go take a bath, you know, or go on a run. Um, but we just don't think about that because we're so used to doing the same thing over and over and over. Um, and that works in, like I said, driving by and picking up drinks, going and driving by and stopping by the bar, or always having drinks with certain coworkers after you know, after a long work week, especially if you work in a toxic work environment, you don't love your boss or, or your coworkers, or maybe you're like me, I work 95% from home. It's kind of boring sometimes. And boredom is honestly a huge trigger for a lot of people. I'm not doing anything. What? Okay. I've already worked out. I've already done my laundry what am I going to do? I'm going to sit around all day. Well, if I'm not going to do that, maybe I'll, okay, well, it's two o'clock. It's close enough to five. I'll, you know, make myself a little cocktail. Um, and I think it all starts out innocent for a lot of us, but then COVID hit and I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but we were fucked. <laughs> you know, like, I think it really, it really showed our fears and showed our anxieties and showed our, our vulnerabilities as individuals. And it also showed our government's essential, a liquor store is not essential, like let's be real here. Um, so, you know, going back to that propaganda and, and big alcohol and all things like that. But once you start to realize, okay, when I talk to this person, Maybe there's that certain coworker or that, that your boss that is just, they're so infuriating. 
you know, I've had jobs where I am just, and you know, it, you're like, this is an incompetent person. I don't like, you know, I don't like to judge. And I, I try and always be empathetic. And I know other people are going through other things, but sometimes I say, you know what, we all have to leave it at the door when we, when we go into our workspace or whatever it is. And you just get so frustrated or your partner or, you know, and sometimes it's our environment. Sometimes it's just, I think the hard thing for, I think one of the hardest things for people is when it has to do with a person in their life who you can't just like take it out. Right. Like, okay, your boss is very triggering for you. And they like to kind of just bully you a lot. And by the end of the day, you're just so kind of beaten down and you're like, F it. You get that F it mindset and then you go for the drink. Um, it, it'd be nice to get a new boss, <laughs> but that's not to say you can always look for another job. You know, you can do those things, but um that's also where you have to learn the coping mechanisms to deal with someone like that so that when they bother you, it's not so, it, instead of going to a level nine, you're heading to a level six and then eventually a three and recognizing you're letting it go in one ear and out the other and going, you know what, I'm not going to let this person's, whatever is going on with them, their negativity, their intense need to clearly because we all know when somebody is bullying you or being negative to you it's a reflection of what's going on with them it's not a reflection of you and to have that self-awareness it's hard you have to work on it you really really do and it takes time it's not something you're going to learn in a week or a couple of weeks um but as soon as you really just start to pick up on the the people the places the time, the things that good or bad make you want to go and grab that drink. You take that pause and you go, okay, in this moment, what could I do differently? And for a lot of people, not, not again, not everybody, but I've had a lot of like past clients who for them, um, and a majority women, like they loved the routine of pouring a glass of wine while they were cooking and it was the glass in the hand or people, when they go out to socialize, you want to just have something in your hand. There's something about being at a bar or a party where if you're like, there's nothing in my hand, I'm awkward. Is somebody going to ask me why I'm, you know, and first of all, nobody cares. <laughs> you got to learn that it's the spotlight effect. We all think everybody cares about what we're doing 24 seven. They do not. They are worried about them just like you are worried about you because people are selfish by nature, unfortunately. Um, but it's really just taking that replacement and going, all right, well, you can still have that wine glass. You can still go to the bar and order a drink, you know, a mocktail. And nowadays so many places have, and for me, the differentiator between a mocktail is the sugar juice water you're trying to sell me for $15 that I'm not going to buy and a non-alcoholic cocktail that actually has a non-alcoholic spirit in it or a non-alcoholic beer or a wine where I can really actually have a real wine glass or I'll ask them, Hey, I'm just going to have like a, like my go-to if they don't have anything, I'll ask for like a ginger beer and grapefruit juice. It's just a little bit bitter. It gives me a kick. I love grapefruit juice. And I just say, can you, can you just put it in a cocktail glass, please? Instead of like a regular, whatever else kind of glass they would give me. And to me, and I'm out with friends, I just feel part of, and I think as human nature, we just want to feel connected to other people. We want to feel like we're part of what other people are doing. We don't want to be ostracized. And that goes way, 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 way back, like hundreds of thousands of years because when you're the ostracized one, you're the one that gets eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. Yikes. Don't want that. So it's totally normal for you to want that. But also no one's going to be asking what's in your glass. Like, but at home, just switch it up. I say throw some seltzer water in there. Throw some non-alcoholic wine. Get, get, have fun with that. Put some berries in there. 
you know, um, and really just either replace some things need to be taken out completely. Right. Like I think, unfortunately, like there are sometimes what relationships, romantic friendships that just aren't going to work anymore because it's built around partying and doing all that stuff. And that's okay because that, that's, those are not your people at the end of the day. If your relationship is only connected through drinking, then you don't really actually have anything in common with them. And so it's really interesting to just kind of, you get to reevaluate who you are as a person, whether you're trying to cut back, whether you're trying to quit. I always tell people like, it's a really good idea as you're creating that plan of action. When you press that pause, as you go through either the tools in my book, or obviously you can look online, just looking up like coping mechanisms um, for when you're angry, for when you're sad, um, identifying the emotion. I think a lot of times we just don't know how to identify that emotion. Like for a long time, I didn't really understand the difference between like being angry and disappointed. It felt the same to me physiologically. And so I reacted as if I was angry. And then later on, when I understood the difference, I was able to take a step back. And instead of react out of anger. I was able to take a deep breath and go, you know what? This wasn't what I was expecting. I'm disappointed. Now I'm going to walk away from the situation. And so you have to have and learn, which again, takes time, the self-discipline to take the pause and go, okay, I'm, what am I feeling right now? Like you said, what am I feeling physiologically in my body? What am I feeling in my brain? Is it anxiety? Is it fear? Is it sadness? Um, is it excitement? Um, and if you can kind of playing that tape through of like, okay, well, if I do have this drink, am I at a place where I can control it and it's going to be one or two, or do I still need to work on some other things because one is going to actually be six, which is actually going to be question mark. Um, and being like radically honest with yourself too. And in that moment, right. Having that plan beforehand to go, okay, I'm going out. Um, tonight I'm limiting myself. This is how many I want to drink, or I'm not going to drink at all tonight and going, okay, how am I going to stick to this plan? Well, think about it ahead of time. I always use the sports analogies. I have it in the book. I tell people all the time, like you don't go into a game for me, like as a former athlete, like I'm not going to go on the pitch, not warming up, having no idea what there's no game plan. Hey guys, we're just going to wing it. Let's see what happens. You're going to call out something. I don't know what that means, but let's just, let's hope. But that's, that's dumb. <laughs> Do that in life and all things like preparation, prevention. And so telling yourself, okay, if, if I get really, really triggered by something good or bad, um, I'm going to take five minutes. I'm going to go in the bathroom. I'm going to walk outside. I'm going to have my, my headphones on me. I'm going to put them in and I'm going to pop this, you know, breath work in or this meditation, or I have you know, a group chat of friends who are keeping me accountable. I'm going to text that group. Or I'm going to call somebody and have those things already set into, into motion. That way, if something does happen, which half the time, nothing, nothing happens. Preparing is always good because how you feel when you leave the event or when you stay on track and you look at the end of the week and you go, you know what? I used to drink 20 drinks a week and now I'm down to 10. The confidence that you build and how much better you feel about yourself, not just mentally, but also physically, like that becomes the reward in itself in that kind of triangle of rather than the reward being the, the way you feel when you take that drink. Because, you know, obviously if you're anxious or whatever you're feeling, 
it's helping to kind of, you know, turn the volume down on that but it's only temporary and you're only trading it for feeling the same way later on, unfortunately. So finding these other tools that it doesn't have to be a trade-off, right? There's no negative consequences later for doing breath work or just saying no, like going, you know what, in the beginning saying, you know what, I don't think I'm ready to go out to this like big barbecue where there's going to be a ton of drinking and all of my binge drinking friends are going to be there. And I just know that I can't trust myself yet. Don't go like, yeah, some people are going to be bummed, but guess what? They're all going to be fucking hammered in like a couple of hours. And they're not going to know if you were there or not. You could probably lie and say, yeah, I showed up. And they'll be like, yep, you did. (laughs) Not suggesting lying, but just kind of remember that, you know, and it's, it's, it's interesting. It's all very interesting. We have a lot of assumptions about the way people are going to act around us, the way that things are going to go, but you have to just go and try it, show up to the party dead ass sober and stay dead ass sober and, and, and watch what happens. Everyone gets louder. The conversations get stupider (laughs) and you're like, all right, I'm going to leave. Like go, go to places, learn more about yourself. Like, I don't, I don't know if I necessarily talked about this in the book, but it is something I would recommend is like, no matter what your end goal is taking like a 30 day, as long as you're obviously disclaimer, as long as you're not alcohol dependent, meaning you get withdrawal symptoms, if you don't drink, take like a 30 day period off. Like this is not in any means saying like you have to stay abstinent. But it's a great way to lower your tolerance if you're drinking a lot and you're like, okay, I need to just, it takes me three drinks to get the same feeling as one. It's going to help you lower that. It's going to help your body kind of recalibrate itself. You're going to sleep better. You're going to lose weight. You're going to, your skin's going to get better. It's going to do a lot of things, but also in that time, try going and doing all of the same things, the same activities. Um, that you normally would do while drinking, see if you actually enjoy them. And I think it tells you a lot about yourself and your lifestyle and what you actually like to do, who you actually are, and what is you versus what is drinking or under the influence you. And then when that 30 days is over, kind of reassess, okay, well, I did learn a lot about myself. And you know what? I don't actually like enjoying, or I I don't love karaoke. I'm actually terrible at it. And <laughs> I'd rather be at home watching, binging Love Island, you know, um, and that's okay. And, and there's so many ways to do it, but I think it's just more important than anything, understanding you're not alone. There's so, so many people who are questioning their relationship with alcohol now more than ever. Um, there's no judgment from so many people, especially the online communities, I would say are, are so, it's so rad. There's, there's online meetings, there's meetups. Um, like you had mentioned before, like for our Instagram, like if you're ever like, Hey, I'm in this place and I need, do you know of a, a support group in my area? Or do you know of like, a group of people, we probably do. So send us a message. If you need resources, if you're like, all right, podcasts don't really work for me, or I don't have time to read a ton of books. Like what else would you recommend? There's podcasts, there's audiobooks. There's always something else. There's, there's infinite tools, which is so nice. And again, there's just going to keep getting to be more. And so, and knowing that again, you're going to evolve as a person. And so what you're using now, maybe in a year or even in six months might be different. And that's okay because you should be evolving as a person and and changing as you grow, as you learn more, as you learn more about yourself. And so it's all really exciting, but I think having that plan of action, just like in sports, having like, having that visualization going in 
already being warmed up, already having a game plan. So when you walk on the pitch, you're game ready. That's really kind of the idea behind it. And I'm, I'm very thankful because all of that to me, before I even really got into visualization or, or mindfulness and the things that I practice now, I had learned in high school from my lacrosse coach. She practiced visualization with us. And I, I, I talk about it in the book, but she would literally have us sit in the locker room and lay down on the ground in our positions, close our eyes. And she would go over for like 10 minutes. All right, the ball's here and you pass it to this person and then it's interfered with. And then you, and go. And so you get in your mind, you already picture what's happening. So I'm already 10 minutes ahead of the other team because I've already been on the pitch in my mind for 10 minutes. I'm ready. And you can do that visualization with anything before, before you go out, before you go to work, before you have an uncomfortable conversation, close your eyes and go through it in your mind, go through the different scenarios. So you are prepared. And I think that's just in general in life, like such a good thing to do. Never walk in blindfolded. You can always have a, a way to be ready. And it, it makes such a night and day difference because you're not caught off guard. And again, maybe you have a slip. Sometimes it happens, right? And you're in that position and you're like, man, I didn't use my tool or, you know, I should have done this instead. That's a learning moment. You go, you know what, next time, you know, take an extra 10 minutes before you go out and really, really think about, okay, if I'm asked for that extra shot and I'm feeling like this, or, you know, if the peer pressure comes or what if so-and-so shows up and I'm feeling like really anxious, like know thyself, there's always an option to leave. There's always an option to say no. And that doesn't make you a weaker person or, or anything like that. And I think there's just a misconception. Like, don't worry about what anybody else is thinking. Worry about you. And for me, especially in the beginning of my journey, I, everything that I did, I reminded myself, even if I don't like what I'm doing or it's hard or it's, excuse you. Sorry, my dog. Um, He has allergies. Um, I just remind myself, like at the end of the day, even if it's tedious, even if it feels like, okay, I don't know why I'm doing this, or you haven't practiced a lot of these things before, or ever really heard about them. Um, journaling, if you've never journaled before, if you've never done sound therapy and you're like, why am I listening to weird pitches? I promise you, <laughs> it is doing something for your brain. And just keep doing it and just keep reminding yourself, okay, me in six weeks is going to be so grateful for what me today is doing. Me in a month, me in three months, whatever it is. I used to write letters to myself from me six weeks to, to present day me, thanking me for continuing to do this and that because then it gets me to that place. You blink your eyes at six weeks later. You're in the place you want to be and you can look back at that version of yourself that was struggling and go, I'm so glad that I stuck with it for this version of myself because inevitably that version of yourself exists in time in six weeks. So you have the option. Am I going to make that person proud? Am I going to prepare? Am I going to be the person I want to be the six week version, the three month version, the six month version? Um, you have that power, you have that control. And I think connecting with that version of yourself is empowering. And it, it's, a, it's a cognitive behavioral therapy tool. Um, and I found it extremely helpful, especially when I'm not feeling motivated. Yes, and, and thank you for having me. And I, and I hope that, you know, uh, again, join Soberish on Instagram. Myself personally, my direct messages are always open. My email is always open. Um, you know, uh, reach out. 
Bye. Bye.